Day's Work of the Fates. Translated from the French version, One Journey des Parcs, by Alain René Lesage. Divided into two sittings. Sitting the first. Clotho, Lachesis, Atropos. Lachesis. Here. Daughters of Jupiter and the Miss, Atropos, Clotho, come my sisters, and let us work, sure it is time now to begin our labor of the day. Clotho. Yes, there you are right, the nectar we have been drinking at the table of the immortal gods, has a little amused us, but we shall go on with our work the more eagerly. Lachesis. Very true. Come, Clotho, then prepare the distaff, my fingers long to turn the spindle. Let us spin, let us spin. Atropos. Let us cut, let us cut, I say. Vulcan has just made me a pair of new scissors and I must try them, let us see who shall have their first stroke. Clotho. Let us first send down to the dark realms below, some millions of humankind, afterwards we will spin. And regulate the destinies of those mortals which are to be born this day. Lock, ah. Well said, how agreeably we shall pass the day. Clotho. Presenting a packet of thread to Atropos. Here, Atropos, I can't offer a worthier stroke, for the first use of the scissors, than to give them a part of this great packet of threads to destroy. These are the lives of 200,000 combatants, just drawing their sabres, on the frontiers of Persia. Atropos. Oh. How shall stray the field of battle? She cuts there. There are 30,000 down at least. Clotho. Let the rest live, till we feel longing, to make a new slaughter. I must say within these few years we have sent a handsome number of Turks and Persians to the dominions of Pluto. Atropos. We have not dismissed fewer of the Indians, black and white, what a pleasure for us. To have this despotic authority over the humankind, and to make those petty beings feel, that the shortening, or the prolonging their days depends upon our pleasure. Allens, sisters of mine, second me. I find myself in a strong disposition to work. I fancy you have both the same inclination. Lachesis. It would be wrong to doubt it. Atropos. How many must take the leap after these mabometans? Clotho. Bringing another packet of thread another heap of warriors I deliver up to you. These are two more armies observing each other upon the banks of the Po, with indefatigable vigilance, and animated with an equal fury, burning with impatience to charge. Lachesis. We must satisfy them. Atropos. Cutting I shall exterminate a great number on both sides. Clotho. You have made great execution amongst the French, and the Piemontese. Atropos. And still greater amongst the Germans. Lachesis. Presenting two hanks an important place is besieging in Germany. Besides a numerous garrison that defend it. The Rhine to render it inaccessible, swells its waters, and the most dreadful overflowing seem to endeavour to drown the besiegers, but the more obstacles, they find, the more obstinate they are to surmount them. They are now going to attack the horn work. And the besieged are preparing to repulse them. Atropos. Cutting part of both the hanks. Let us destroy more of the besiegers than the besieged, but that shall not prevent the place from being speedily yielded, that is one of our decrees. Lachesis. Yes, but let us add, if you please, that the besiegers shall lose a commander, whose loss shall be greater to them, than that of the town to the besieged. Clotho. Bringing a hank cut this hank, with one stroke you will be the ruin of a hundred and fifty soldiers, sailors, and passengers, that are in a Venetian ship, upon the Adriatic Gulf, a horrible tempest is just risen, the whistling of the winds and the roaring of the waves, make the neighbouring shores tremble, the vessel is already without masts, without rudder, it must sink to the bottom, unless we order otherwise. Atropos. Let it sink, let it sink the men that are in it, are good for nothing but drowning. Lachesis. I command mercy, for a young Frenchman of genius. Who is amongst the passengers, let him save himself upon a plank. And be thrown on the coast of Albany. Clotho. Be it so. Atropos. 
Well, he shall be saved, since you desire it, he shall turn renegado, and be circumcised at Constantinople, where six months after he shall be impaled for speaking with irreverence of the great prophet of the Muslim men. Lachesis. I only wish to save him from the shipwreck, that he might meet with that treatment from the Turks. Clotho. Since you have such good-natured intentions for this man of wit, let him escape them from the fury of the waves, be all the rest the food for fishes. We so often regale the aquatic inhabitants with such repasts, that I don't know whether men eat more fish, than fishes eat men. Atropos. Cutting the whole hank excepting one thread the sea monsters shall feast today. Lachesis. Bringing another hank a new packet to cut. A dreadful earthquake is this moment felt in a city of Italy, the houses all shake to their foundations, and the earth opens to swallow them up, with the miserable wretches that inhabit them. How many citizens shall we destroy? Clotho. Two thousand only, whatever pleasure it gives us to massacre these mortals, we must set bounds to our fury, or the human race would soon be extinct. Atropos. You don't consider what you say, Clotho, if we should put to death two hundred thousand this day, it would not be a knight of London, Paris, or Pekin. Lachesis. Atropos speaks the truth. Let us exercise boldly the power we have over mankind. In spite of the vast extent of waters. And immense spaces of earth that separate those people. We are with both in the fame instant, we have the universe under our eyes, and see all that passes in it. Let us sacrifice without mercy whomsoever we please. Clotho. Bringing a great packet of thread. These are lives of the inhabitants of the great city of Mexico. Where there now reigns a contagious disease. We retrenched from this number of the living yesterday a thousand of these poor wretches, let us sentence fifteen hundred of them today, including some Spaniards who have married Mexican women, and choose rather to live miserably in New Spain, than to return into the old, without making a figure there. Atropos. Tatting a part of the threads can anything exceed the pride of a Spaniard? Lachesis. Presenting another hank this little hank contains the threads of fifty Indians of Peru, who are assembled upon the summit of a high craggy mountain, to celebrate the memory of their Inca the good Atabalapa, don't let us oppose their courageous resolutions, they have above ten thousand spectators flocked from all parts, to see and to admire the immortal action they are going to perform. These fifty victims have already sung verses in praise of their dear Inca. To the melancholy found of their flutes, see they fall now into a kind of despair, they devote themselves to death. And throw themselves from the highest precipice that they may follow their prince into the other world, and serve him there. Atropos. After having cut the hank these Indians of Peru are good creatures, in truth they deserved a little more humanity than the Spaniards showed them, when they conquered their country. Clotho. Giving a small hank of thread Jupiter is darting his thunder near the end of Saint Domingo, upon the vessel of a Spanish privateer. The whole crew by a series of impious and barbarous actions, have drawn upon themselves the wrath of the gods, a flash of lightning falls this moment upon the magazine of powder, and the ship flies up into the air with every man that is on board. Atropos. Cutting let them go, and join Arjux in hell, Lachesis. Presenting a hank you behold seventy-five religious mendicants, assembled in a general chapter which is now held in a corner of Bas Bretagne. Those who are born noble. Say that the first dignities of their order belong rightfully to the gentlemen monks. The commons pretend to have a share in them, and propose the dignities to be rendered alternative. Tis the quarrel of the patricians and the plebeians. The reverend fathers there on each side are heated. And are going to conclude the dispute by blows, they draw good cudgels, with which they were armed, from beneath their frocks, and behold! How they knock one another down! How many do you desire should be left upon the spot? Clotho. Fifteen, who are, ten common religious, three guardians, one provincial, and a definitor. Atropos. After having cut the business is done, there are fifteen dead, and twenty wounded. Lachesis. That is not too much for the combat of a chapter of monks in Bas Bretagne. Clotho. Holding some threads a new operation for us. Atropos. Whose threads are these? Clotho. 
The threads of four Germans, who are in a debauch at Strasbourg, with two French actresses, in four and twenty hours that they have been at table, they have drunk a hundred bottles of wine, they are falling from their chairs at last, shall we kill them with the surfeit? Lachesis. No, no if you please, as to the mentees well. But the women shan't so much as feel any disorder, for they are to begin again tomorrow upon a new account. With two of the officers in garrison who have invited them to supper. Do you remember, sisters, what agreeable lives we have spun for these two fair ones? Ah. Oh yes, I remember it now. Clotho. So do I, I remember, we appointed they should go both to Paris, and make their fortune there very differently. One should abandon her profession, to make herself the slave of an old rich gallant, who treating her in the Turkish taste, should keep her close prisoner in a magnificent apartment, where she should see none but her gala and her keepers. Lachesis. That was indeed our decree. Atropos. I have forgot what fate we ordained for her companion. Clotho. Her companion more happy, is to enjoy an entire liberty, shall shine upon the stage, be equipped according to the taste of some generous man of quality, and amass a considerable sum. But so delicious a life shall be of no long duration, this favourite actress shall disappear suddenly in the flower of her age, with one stroke of your scissors you shall snatch her from the applause of the public. And notwithstanding her wealth, her interment shall be as mean, as that of one of the same condition in a neighbouring nation shall be splendid, at the very same time. Lachesis. That people do too much honour to the dramatic talent, and the French too little. The genius of nations are different, as you see. Clotho. This little heap of Parisan threads will amuse you for a moment. Atropos. Oh. You please me, my dear Clotho, by bringing me these threads. I am charmed when I do the good office to the inhabitants of Paris. Lachesis. That is a charm which happens to you every day. Clotho. I give you up first this chemical philosopher, who having reached his fourteenth lustre, has broke off all commerce with his friends, and shut himself up in his laboratory, to stir out no more, he will see nobody but an old housekeeper, who has took care of him these thirty years. He is tired he says of living, and though he has his health to a miracle, he keeps his bed like a sick man drawing near his end. Lachesis. This poor philosopher has fired his brain by his chemical operations. Atropos. Cutting the thread since life is a burden to him, out of pity I'll deliver him from it. Clotho. Drawing another thread from the hank whilst you are so mercifully inclined, take this poor citizen out of his sorrows, who having always lived in indigence, has lately buried a brother who has left him two hundred thousand francs in specie. The joy of inheriting so rich a succession, had almost turned his brain, and if it had, he would have been less to be pitied. Lachesis. How can that be? Clotho. Because he does not know how to secure his treasure, the fear of placing it ill, agitates him without ceasing, he has not one moment's repose, nothing seems fate, he distrusts everything, and is a man greatly embarrassed. Atropos. Out of charity I'll put an end to his embarrassment. Clotho. Smiling and drawing out another thread what humanity. I must furnish you with an opportunity of doing another charitable action. Atropos. I shall not let it escape me. Clotho. We have too long let an old canon of fourscore languish, who without reckoning the asthma that chokes him, has the gout in his left knee, and the sciatica in his right hip, let us cure him radically of all his pains. Besides is of no use upon earth we ought to have made his prebend vacant, ten years ago. Lachesis. Why really there are so many of these antique figures seen in the world. That we ought to be reproached with their long existence, tis a want of attention to our business. Which we must reform. Atropos. Let us reform, let us give no quarter to decrepit old age. Clotho. Showing another thread well, then no quarter for this old professor of the university who above these three score years has not brushed his clothes for fear of wearing them, he is a pedant, swallowed up in the love of the ancients, he is fallen ill, and as he does not believe he shall recover of his distemper, he said this morning to a friend of his, what comforts me in my death, is, that I never read a modern author. 
Lachesis. Laughing a pleasant consolation indeed. Atropos. Cutting let him die satisfied then, this faithful partisan of antiquity. Clotho. Presenting three threads together here are three mortals that make us cried out upon every day we let them live, and indeed we seem to have entirely forgot them. They are three old men who are incapable of executing their usual functions, a lawyer, who can no longer employ his eloquence in the cause of injustice, a celebrated physician, who has given over killing the sick, and a good Capuchin father, who can't stir out of his convent to dine abroad. Lachesis. Let us make these variable persons disappear immediately. Atropos. Cutting the threads tis doing them a pleasure to abridge so melancholy a life. Clotho. Showing another thread this slender thread expects the same favour from us, tis the web of life of a beautiful and virtuous marchioness, far advanced in her career. We had spun her a long life exempt from all misfortunes, but the good lady is a devotee that loves herself a little too much, and grows old with a bad grace, instead of letting her charms drop easily down to decay, every morning at her toilet, when she looks in her glass, she weeps for the loss of them. I am of opinion that we must terminate the course of her life, to prevent the despair she must soon be in to see herself decrepit. Atropos. Cutting I consent to it, let us spare her that vexation. Lachesis. I vote too, for doing her that piece of service, the world must own we are sometimes obliging. Clotho. Presenting two threads these two feminine threads deserve a stroke too, they are two distracted old women, one a widow. The other unmarried, the first has been fool enough to strip herself of her whole estate, to settle her children advantageously, who to show their gratitude let her want necessaries the last, born amorous and liberal, is left without either money or lovers, after having for fifty years together spent her revenue upon young cadets. Lachesis. I pity these two poor creatures. Atropos. Cutting both the threads cease to pity them, they are no longer alive. Clotho. Giving another thread give an infernal passport immediately to this old gouty banker, to the court of Rome, you will fulfil the prayers of his young wife, who burns with impatience to kill his place with a gay, jolly companion, that teaches her music. Atropos. Cutting we must satisfy her, but I fancy she'd have something less eagerness in flying to a second match, if she knew that her singing master would change his note, as soon as he became her husband. Lachesis. Bringing a thread let us purge the earth of this old priest. Who has passed two-thirds of his life in poverty, and now possesses twenty thousand levers every year in benefices, which he owes, not to his virtue, but to that intriguing spirit we endowed him with at the day of his birth. Far from giving a share of his treasure to the poor, he delights in nothing but heaping up, he dotes upon his louis doors, his only pleasure is to count them every night and kiss them one by one as he puts them into his strong box, he does not live as he used to do, upon the produce of his masses, and he is so tired of saying them, that now he won't so much as hear them. Atropos. Cutting. It's all over now, he shall kids his Louis doors no more, they shall be shared between three or four heirs, whom out of avarice and pride, in his lifetime he would never see. Clotho. Picking out a thread amongst the aged who still live by our negligence, I perceive one that inclines me to compassion. Tis a religious. Whom the brotherhood have kept these thirty years. Imprisoned in a dark dungeon, where they afford him so small nourishment, that he is worn to a living anatomy. Lachesis. So severe a penance, must suppose some great crime. Clotho. However great his fall may be he has thoroughly expiated it by the pains he has endured. He has for above five and twenty years strove in vain every day by prayers, and tears, to move his community, and now implores only our suckers, let us show that we have less hard-heartedness than the monks. Atropos. Cutting the thread we will lend him then our assistance. Lachesis. Presenting another thread let us pay at the same time the debts of an old bishop pestered persecuted and tormented by an importunate crowd of creditors. As his lordship has no other revenue but that of his bishopric, which brings him in only fifty thousand levers a year, he has been obliged to borrow, on all hands, better to sustain his dignity of prince of the church. 
Now they would have him give up his revenues for a time to his creditors, and live privately, and without pomp. Atropos. Live privately and without pomp. What an affront to a prelate. We must save him from it. Let us send my lord into the Elysian fields amongst the happy shades. She cuts the thread clotho. Good. Let him go into that charming habitation, provided my lords the judges don't send him on the road to Tartarus, to revenge his poor creditors. Lachesis. Bringing a new thread I have a malicious longing that I must satisfy, a rich old tradesman has two sons for his heirs, he has bought the eldest, whom he idolizes, a very honorable post, and forced his second, whom he does not love, into a convent. This youngest to obey his father took the habit, without the least call to it, and after having made his vows he has just apostatized, to punish the old man for having made so wicked a monk, let us cut off the days of his eldest son, who is childless. Atropos. Cutting this is not ill-contrived, it's the ready way to mortify the father, he will have the vexation to have made one of his children miserable, to enrich the other, absolutely to no purpose. Lachesis. And to think that the nephews and nieces, whom he hates and can't bear to see, will become his heirs. Clotho. I have my fancies too. Atropos. Who hinders you from satisfying them? Clotho. Presenting three threads together no mercy for these three croaked threads that I abandon to your scissors, they are two Normans, and a strolling Gascon lady, they have left their own country to seek their fortune in the good city of Paris, the nursing mother of all the vagabonds of those two provinces. One of these Normans, after having worn the livery of a farmer general of the revenues, and passed all the employments that succeed it, is become lord of the village, where he was born. The other who had been at school in Cayenne, has profited of his little Latin by creeping into the family of a fat prebendary, whose favour he has found means to gain so far, as to catch two considerable benefices, and the fair Gascon, prudent as well as pretty, has made herself a small fund, of fifty thousand crowns, out of the purses of the Letty and the clergy. Atropos. Cutting all the threads since you wish it so. The lord of the village, the beneficed man, and the adventurer lady, shall go in a moment to the redoubtable meadow where Ecus waits to interrogate them, I believe that judge will have no need of my nose, to know whether he must condemn them, to go the road of Tartarus. Lachesis. Giving a thread to cut let us deliver humankind from the prodigal of an abbe, who can't possibly live upon sixty thousand livers a year, who runs in debt on all hands, tricks the whole world, and whom, in fine, necessity of money makes capable of anything. His purse, like the sieves of the Danaids, is empty the moment it is full, if all the monarchs upon earth should send him their revenues, he could find a method of spending them. Atropos. Cutting the thread in haste what a destroyer of money. He does not deserve to see the light. Clotho. Presenting a new thread no pardon for this extravagant pleader, the party he is at law with, is a woman that for twenty years at least, was his mistress, he is lately married to her and now is pleading for a divorce. Atropos. Cutting R. Thule. Lachesis. Giving another thread. We will finish the divisions that reign in the family, of an unjust and humorous old merchant, though he is above seventy-two, he won't let his two sons have the least hand in his affairs, though they could conduct them much better than himself. Atropos. Cutting the thread. I'll agree the father and the children presently. Clotho. Offering another thread cut this thread, tease that of one of the most deceitful ecclesiasts that ever was in a seminary, the hypocrite has played his part so well, that he has been nominated to a considerable abbey. He has already sent his money to Rome to pay for his bulls, they are upon the road, let us make Mons el Abbey disappear before they arrive. Atropos. Cutting the thread he shall not have the pleasure to see them. Lachesis. Giving another thread and laughing a great hog of an epicure, has just dreamed that he was at table, and wakes on a sudden, and rings a bell, to call his cook. And orders him to get ready that dish he saw in his dream. For his dinner. Let us be malicious enough to deprive the glutton of the pleasure of this repast. Atropos. Cutting you are satisfied. Clotho. Bringing a hank. 
these threads are the lives of twenty gentlemen of the road, and other such men of honour, just carrying out of the prisons of London, to submit to the chastisement of justice. Astonishing nation! With what an unconcerned look these criminals go to the place of execution. Atropos. Cutting the thread O. Oh. The English are men of resolution, they generally quit life without regret, and are either not afraid of the regions of Pluto, or don't believe them, they know they must die, and tis indifferent to them whether tis today or tomorrow. Lachesis. Hold, my dear sisters, I have just made a reformation, we are too good today, we destroy none but what are distracted, useless or inconvenient in civil society. What are we thinking of? Is it thus that the fates, not less cruel than the Eumenides, ought to busy themselves? One would think. To see the choice we make of our victims, that we strove to appear equitable in the eyes of mankind. It seems as if we were afraid they should disapprove our actions, as if we troubled ourselves about their complaints and their murmurs. Clotho. Your approach is just. We make a kind of court of justice of the destinies, it was want of thought. Let us strike more boldly, bathe ourselves in human blood. Let the malice and the barbarity of our actions show that they are ours. Atropos. Such sentiments charm me. Bring me then my dears, the threads of the most revered mortals upon earth, let us be insensible of the sorrow we shall cause. Lachesis. You may depend upon our firmness of spirit. Clotho. Drawing a thread from a fresh hanker noble stroke to give, my dear Atropos. Let us fill Europe and Asia, with surprise, to cut this thread is a murder worthy of us. Let us snatch from this young emperor his crown with a life which has made his people conceive the greatest hopes of prosperity. He has cast his eyes upon a princess in his court, and designs to make her share his throne, all is ready for the marriage, the ceremony of which would be performed tomorrow, if we approved it, but our pleasure is, to deceive the expectation of this young monarch we will change the preparations for this marriage into his funeral, spread consternation through his palace, and divert ourselves with the cries of all the courtiers he was dear to. Atropos. Cutting the affair will be soon over, a sovereign's thread of life is as soon cut as his meanest subjects. Lachesis. Bringing a thread a young and a charming princess, the ornament and pride of one of the finest courts upon earth, is now ill she is surrounded with physicians, who fatter themselves they shall recover her. Let us make their hopes and their science vain, as we generally do in dangerous diseases. Atropos. Cutting I give her the mortal blow, unmoved with the tears of the prince her husband. Fainting by her bed. Or the lamentations and cries of her women around her. Clotho. By that inhuman, that noble firmness, I know my sister. Courage Atropos, after the two executions you have performed, sure you won't refuse to lend a hand to this. She gives her a thread Atropos. What is this thread then? Clotho. That of the general of an army, of a great leader, who reunites in his own breast, all the qualities of a hero. Make him feel your power in the midst of his troops, you'll break off a life which fire and sword have respected these seventy years. Atropos. Cutting we have spun him so many glorious days, he ought now to die satisfied. Lachesis. Giving another thread. No quarter, no quarter for this illustrious magistrate, who makes so great a figure in life, much beloved, much esteemed, and endowed with the most penetrating judgment. Atropos. With a look of surprise you do not consider, Lachesis. Lachesis. Excuse me. I do. Atropos. We should make our court very ill to my mother, by taking off so soon one of her most zealous sacrifices. Lachesis. Cut it, cut it however. The miss will murmur at first, but she will be appeased when we represent to her that the fates spare no man, and besides, this magistrate, she is so fond of, will soon have his post as worthily filled by a successor. Atropos. Oh. The miss must be satisfied with the reasons, she cuts the thread C. Our magistrate is stripped of the power of judging others, and must go himself to hear his own sentence pronounced. End of the first part. Day's work of the fates. 
sitting the second. Clotho, Lachesis, Atropos. Clotho. Submitting to your better judgment, sisters I should think it proper we should rest a little now. Lachesis. What do you mean, Clotho? Will we made for rest? Clotho. No, but it is a rest to us. To change our work, therefore let us cease our cutting the threads for a few minutes, and begin to make use of the distaff. The pleasure of spinning adventures for the newborn children, is what has most charms for me. Atropos. I say the same, though I am mightily entertained with using my scissors. Lachesis. Then we are all three agreed, spinning is my favorite occupation, tis my business to turn the spindle. Come, my little ones, bring me quickly the baskets where we keep our black and white threads. Range the vases round me, that I generally dip the end of my fingers in when I spin, and which contain those different liquors, that communicate virtues and vices to the sons of men. Atropos. Bringing a vase. Here is one of the vases you put your hands oftenest to, that of voluptuousness. Clotho. Bringing two vases and here are the vats of gaming and drinking, you don't dip your fingers less in them I'm certain. Atropos. Bringing another vase the liquor of this you see here, was drawn out of SDYX, this forms tyrants, assassins, and the rest of the wicked race. Clotho. Bringing two other vases these are the vases of lying and deceit. Atropos and Clotho. Bring all the vases of the passions, the vices, and the virtues, and range them around Lachesis Lachesis. Looking round her I don't see the vases of beauty and good nature here. Atropos. There they are both, at your left hand. Lachesis. Oh. Yes, I find them out, she perceives that Clotho is looking for something what are you seeking, Clotho? Clotho. I am looking a vase I can't find, Lachesis. What vase is that? Clotho. The vase of chastity. Lachesis. I know where it is, but very likely we shan't want it now. That must not be used every day, we can't be too sparing of it. In the first ages of the world, we consumed so much of the liquor it contains, that we have scarce enough left now, to endue the nuns withal. Atropos. We will do without that then, and without the vase of humility. That is very precious too, and we preserve it as carefully, we scarce ever use it, not even when we are forming the monks, Lachesis. Come, let us spin then. But stay, we want something still. Clotho. What? Lachesis. The little basket with gold and silk thread. We may take a fancy to make some mortal happy today. Atropos. That's a fancy we seldom hear. Clotho. Bringing a little basket with gold and silk threads if by chance we should have such an inclination, here is wherewithal to satisfy it. Lachesis. Now then, let us spin the destinies of the children that are to be born. Clotho. There are several born already since we began to work, amongst the rest. One in the seraglio of the Grand Sania, the favorite sultana is brought to bed of a prince. Let us begin with that. She draws the flax to spin. Lachesis. Spinning we appoint, ordain, and command, that the life of this newborn prince shall be long, that he shall pass his infancy in the arms of his father and mother, and augment by his innocent caresses, that love of which he was the happy pledge. Atropos. Mark, Lachesis, mark by some black shades the dreadful danger, I will have him threatened with, before he attains his sixteenth year. The Janissaries, so dreaded by their masters, shall revolt against the government, shall depose the father of this young prince, and set the brother of the deposed sultan upon the throne. The new emperor at first shall be tempted to follow the sanguinary maxims of his predecessors, and have his nephew strangled, but he shall not yield to so cruel a temptation, on the contrary. He shall conceive the strongest friendship for him, and take as much care of his education, as if he was his own son. Clotho. Add to this, I desire you, that the young prince shall remain a great number of years in the seraglio, after which by a new revolution, which shall cost the lives of above sixty thousand Muslim men, his uncle shall be deposed in his turn, and he raised to the empire, he shall then fill the place of his father, who shall be dead, 
and using the same humanity, shall spare the blood of his family. Lachesis. I subscribe to these decisions. Be this the irrevocable sentence of the fates. Now let us go on to another child. Atropos. Softly. Softly, sister, when you are spinning the life of this newborn prince, how come you to make no use of your vases? I suppose it was to make a prince without vices or virtues. Lachesis. Well, he would not be the first we have made of that character. Clotho. I agree to that. But give him at least, a reasonable dose of voluptuousness, would you have him live in his seraglio, like a Carthusian in his cell? Lachesis. Smiling and dipping her finger in the vase of voluptuousness no truly, I did not think of it. I should have made a very poor sultan. Atropos. Now let us pass from Constantinople to Pekin. We have just regulated the events of the life of a Turkish prince, now let us spin the fate of a princess born a quarter of an hour ago, in the palace of the Emperor of China. Tis the fiftieth daughter of that great monarch. The mother of this princess is one of the three concubines of the second class, and the same, which last year lay in of a prince. Whom his Chinese majesty will one day appoint for his successor. You know, we have endued the male child with all the inclinations of his father, and above all, a strong attachment to the ceremonies of the bonzes, with a strong curiosity of learning trifles that are useless to monarchs to know. What qualities do you think proper to give the female? Clotho. Both good and bad. Let her have wit and beauty, and such very little feet that she can't stand upon them, but let her have such fits of women ill humour, that shall make all her women distracted. Lachesis. After having put her band in the vase of caprice and the vases of wit and beauty. This princess, will be very difficult to serve, I promise you. Atropos. From the daughter of an emperor, will you condescend to stoop to two children of the commonalty? Clotho. Why not? Are not all humankind upon a level to us? Lachesis. Certainly, as they are born, we ought to spin their adventures without distinction. Atropos. We are still in China, an embroideress of the Isle of Emark has just brought forth two boys at once, their father who lives in indigence. Seeing it impossible for him to bring M tolerably up, is moved at their misery, and driven by a cruel compassion, he is tempted to go and drown them in the sea. Clotho. Tis because he believes the metempsychosis, and hopes that at the first transmigration, the souls of these children will animate happier bodies. Lachesis. Let us snatch these twins from the barbarous pity of their father. Atropos. Willingly, let us have them adopted, one of them by an officer of the mandarins, who has the cognizance of the civil affairs of that province, the other by a merchant of raw silk, who not being able to have a child either by his wife or his concubines, shall have recourse to this adoption, with a view of having a son, who after his death may take care of the domestic sacrifices, and burn bits of gilt paper before the souls of his ancestors. Clotho. I admire the pious tenderness of these good Chinese for their ancestors, though they all believe. Either the mortality of the soul. Or its transmigration, yet, that does not hinder them from going on their old road, and imagining, that the spirits of their deceased parents flutter round the tablets, where their names are engraved in letters of gold. Lachesis. Nothing can prove more strongly the power of custom, over mankind. Atropos. What shall become of our adopted twins? Clotho. He whom the officer of the mandarins shall make his heir, shall give himself wholly up to the sciences, and his adopted father shall have the satisfaction to see him arrive at the glorious degree of a licentiate. Lachesis. After having dipped her fingers in the vase of learning three years after, our little embroiderer shall obtain an honourable post in the college of doctors that write annals of the Chinese empire, and are charged with the care of collecting the laws both antient and modern. Clotho. He shall afterwards be taken out of that college, he shall become preceptor to the eldest prince of China, and the rest of his life shall be a continued series of honour and pleasure. Atropos. As we have taken a fancy to make a virtuous and fortunate man of this child, out of caprice let us make a rascal and a wretch of his brother. Tis what we do every day. Lachesis. You prevented me. Clotho. 
tis what I was going to propose. Atropos. Smiling in the disposition we are all three in, we shall make a very pretty fellow. Come, Lachesis, put your hand immediately in all the vases of the vices. We must form a mortal capable of everything. Lachesis. After having dipped her fingers in several vases you may now, my sisters, ordain what you please for this boy. I protest to you, I have given him the dispositions necessary to play any part in the world, that you think proper. Clotho. The good seeds which he has received from your beneficent hand, shall spring up surprisingly, he shall play a thousand pranks in his childhood. The merchant of raw silk, after having in vain striven by all manner of chastisements to correct him, shall abandon him. The young man, following his evil inclinations, shall soon fall into the hands of justice, which shall content itself for the first time, to punish him. By applying fifty strokes with a bamboo to his back. This shall have no effect upon him, he shall get himself condemned to the gollies for three years, after which he shall go and present himself to the bonzes of the pagod, near the city of Fock Bay, they shall receive him graciously, and permit him to aspire to the honour of being of their sect. Lachesis. Oh! Since he is to become a bonz, I must endow him with the spirit of his calling, I have not dipped my fingers in the vase of hypocrisy. She puts, her hand in the vase of hypocrisy now he does not want any of the virtues of those venerable solitaries. Clotho. Before the bonzes initiate him into their mysteries, they shall let his hair and his beard remain uncut for the space of a whole year, they shall make him wear an old habit, and oblige him to go from door to door singing the praises of Foe, the idol of the pagod. He shall also be debarred eating anything but herbs and fruit, he must strive without ceasing against sleep, and when he can no longer resist it. One of the brotherhood who has the charge given him of awakening him with the strokes of a bamboo. Shall acquit himself of it very exactly, after this pleasing the vitiate, he shall put on a long grey robe, they shall put on his head a parchment cap covered with black cloth. Afterwards all the bonzes surrounding him, shall chant hymns of which no mortal can understand the meaning and their singing accompanied by the tinkling of little bells, will form a marvellous concert. The ceremony of the reception of the new bonds, shall at last finish by a repast of more abundance than delicacy. At which all the holy brotherhood shall refresh themselves till they are dead drunk. Atropos. To Clotho is this all you ordain to happen to this pious Chinese? Clotho. You may add what you please to it. Atropos. That is what I am going to do. Fifteen years after his having been received a bonds in the manner you have described, he shall be made superior of the pagod. He shall then edify the public with an adventure, of which he shall be the hero, and which shall make a great noise in all the provinces of China. Lachesis. I am curious to know what this great event is, that you design to embellish the history of the bonds with. Clotho. I have the same curiosity. Atropos. Tis this. The daughter of a Chinese doctor, followed by two maid servants, shall be passing by the pagod one day, when the door is open, perceiving no body there, the shall enter in, and advance as far as the altar of the idol, where she shall kneel down to pay her devotions. Our superior hid in a place where he can perceive all without being seen. Shall cast his eyes upon her, and finding her much to his taste, he shall immediately fetch his companions, an order M to carry off these three women. Lachesis. The order I suppose will be no sooner given, than it will be directly executed. Atropos. Certainly, the doctor surprised at not seeing his daughter return, and in pain to know what is become of her, shall make so strict search, that at last he shall hear, that the bonzes have her in their power. He shall immediately address himself to the general of the Tartars in the province, and make his complaint of the rape of his daughter. The general ready to do justice, shall immediately repair to the pagod with the doctor, and demand the women. The bonzes shall answer, that foe in love with the mistress, ordered her to be seized with the two servants. The superior with unparalleled insolence shall add, that foe by condescending to honour a daughter of the doctor with his embraces has heaped honour upon him and all his family. But the Tartar general without listening to the fables of the bonzes, shall himself search every place in the house and gardens. He will hear confused voices out of a cave pierced through a rock, 
he shall immediately order an iron gate that stops the entrance of it, to be forced open, and will find in that subterraneous place the doctor's daughter, with several other young women her companions in misery. They shall be all delivered back to their families, and by the general's orders fire shall be set to the four corners of the pagod, which shall reduce it, and its infamous ministers, to ashes in a moment. Clotho. Telacasis prepare your fingers to spin the life of a girl this moment born in the southern America. A Portuguese born at Brazil, has given an heiress to her husband who is master of one of the richest plantations about the city of Saint Salvador. Let us be liberal of virtue to this child, let us make a little Lucretia of it. Lacasis. O oh fie, Clotho. You must jest I presume, that would be displacing chastity indeed. No, no, tis not worth the trouble of going to look the vase that bestows that virtue. Which we ought never to use but at the request of Minerva, or Juno. A modest woman in Guinea, would appear a new phenomenon. She dips the ends of her fingers in the vases of beauty and voluptuousness let us content ourselves to make this child perfectly beautiful, to this effect I ordain that she shall have a black, shining complexion, a flat thick nose, a very large mouth, and very little eyes. When she arrives at fifteen, she will be the idol of all the Portuguese in Brazil. Atropos. Laughing ha, ha, ha. I can't forbear laughing when I see Lacassus put her hand in the vase of beauty to make such a creature. Why she would be a monster among the Europeans. Lacassus. Yes, so would a complexion of lilies and roses, a little vermilion mouth and two large black eyes, appear frightful to the sunburnt Ethiopians. Clotho. Tis true, beauty is but local, therefore the liquor of this vase conforming itself to the place, forms its beauties to the taste or if you please to the caprice of all nations. Atropos. I know that very well, but I am not in the taste of the Brazilian Portuguese. Locke, nor I neither. A woman to appear handsome to me, must resemble Venus, Pallas, or Juno. Clotho. Upon the banks of the Danube, the wife of an indigent German baron, is just laid in of a male child in her antique hovel. With what qualities do you think proper to endow this little Germanicus? Lacassus. To compensate his poverty, I will make him more beautiful than the morning, and he shall have the mien and shape of the hero of a romance. Atropos. Give him along with that, prudence, wit and courage. Lacassus. Spinning after having dipped her finger in several vases he shall have all the good qualities that you wish him, but he shall love gaming, wine and women, Clotho. Upon this I'll compose a series of adventures that shall happen to him. He shall be left an orphan at twelve years old, and having no estate. He shall get to be page to the envoy of a prince of the empire. And go into France with him, he shall no sooner be at Paris but he shall throw off his bashfulness, he shall have the good fortune to please a princess, who wishing to have him for her page shall beg him of the envoy. She shall obtain him, and keep him in her service till he is five and twenty then our baron shall testify to his mistress a desire of seeing his own country again, the shan't oppose it, and shall make him a gratification of a thousand crowns, but instead of going into Germany, he shall depart for England, which he shall take a fancy to see, upon a relation that has been given him of the wonders of the city of London. Atropos. I am curious to know what is to happen to him there, for you do not make him go for nothing. Clotho. No, certainly. I shall prepare him a pretty singular event there, and which shan't be unprofitable to him. He shall pass near a month in seeing the town and public places, without the least adventure happening to him. But one evening between nine and ten there shall come into the boarding house where he lodges. A man who drawing him aside, shall say to him in German, a very handsome woman of distinction who has seen you in St. James's Park, desires your conversation this evening provided you let yourself be conducted with your eyes blinded, as to anything else, you will run no danger, but that of being in love. Lacassus. Our young baron, in spite of his prudence, shall accept the proposition. Clotho. Without hesitation. Atropos. He shall immediately step into a coach with his guide, who shall blind his eyes and conduct him to a large house, where introducing him into a noble apartment, he shall there see the lady that sent for him. Clotho. 
She shall be masked, and whatever instances the cavalier shall make to oblige her to discover herself, in a conversation of two hours, that they shall have together, the shall never unmask. After this the guide shall carry him back to his lodgings in the same manner that he brought him, and shall say to him, Sir. If there is occasion I shall come for you again. The baron shall guess by these words, that the heroine of the adventure, is a young lady, married to some old English nobleman that wants an heir. And what shall confirm him in this opinion, is, that two months after, the guide shall come to him again, to bring him three hundred guineas, which he shall count out to him saying, in whatever part of the world you are, you may depend upon receiving the same sum every year, and in effect he shall receive it for twenty years successively, without ever knowing from whom, but thoroughly persuaded it is for having made a lord. Lachesis. Why shall his pension cease after twenty years? Clotho. Because the young English nobleman his son, shall go into the army, and perish in the first campaign. Atropos. The wife of an actor in the opera at Brussels, is just brought to bed of twin girls behind the scenes. Let us look upon these children with favourable eyes, and make them celebrated in their way. Lachesis. Willingly, one shall have the voice of a siren, and the other dance as well as terpsichor. Clotho. They shall be entered in their childhood into the opera at Paris. Which they shall not leave till they are loaded with gold and jewels. Atropos. Yes, but I add to it, that they shall find some pretty fellows in their way afterwards, whose acquaintance shall not augment their treasure. Lachesis. Hearken, my sisters, do you hear the cries of a woman in travel, out of a fine hotel in the midst of Paris? She is wife to one of the richest private men in France, to a man whom Plutus cherishes, and who wishes to have an heir, she invokes us under our three mysterious names. Clotho. For the sake of the god of riches, let us save her from death, and put an end to her pains. Atropos. We ought to do it. Lachesis. She is delivered, she brings a boy into the world this instant. Clotho. What a pleasure we shall give to Plutus, if we spin the days of this child, with gold and silk. Atropos. We must not fail of it. Lachesis. No, let us make him a destiny worthy of envy. Clotho. Let us give him all the qualities that Plutus can with to Lachesis dip your fingers in the vases of taste, good sense and property. Atropos. Above all, let him be beneficent and liberal, for a man that is rich and not generous is a monster. Clotho. With all the virtues we have endowed him with, he must have some small vice. It would not be just that a mortal should be more perfect than the gods. Lachesis. Spinning after having put her hand in several vases let me alone, he shall have his share of happiness upon my word, his life shall be long, exempt from vexations, or rather brightened by a continual succession of pleasures, he shall have passions. But they shall never trouble his repose, lest their slave than their master, he shall taste their sweets without feeling their tyranny, he shall be good-natured. Gallant and generous, and what we have never yet granted to anybody, though he pays, yet he shall possess the hearts of his mistresses. Atropos. Let us go from one extremity to another. A shopkeeper's wife in Paris has just brought into the world a male child. Let us make an author of it, we have not made one today, and we used generally to make at least a hundred. Clotho. That's well said, let us make him an universal author a writer that composes both in verse and prose, for all the theatres of Paris, and let it be one of our irrevocable decrees, that he shall write fifty-five dramatic pieces, of which, for shall have a happy success. Lachesis. But those four, happy productions, shall have but an indifferent reception from the public when, ten years after their being new, the play shall attempt to revive them. Atropos. I see an old chambermaid laying a great bundle of linen at the foot of a staircase in an alley, this bundle is a newborn child that they are going to expose. Clotho. Yes, tease the fruit of the shameful amours of a young woman of condition. In this part of the conversation of the fates, I awaked. The end.